The book of Romans is a letter, not a book. I point that out because when we read these letters, we should read them as letters, not books. A book seems to be academic to us. A letter seems to be personal. It's very important to approach the scripture the way it was originally intended to be heard and read. All of these letters were copied by hand, and they were distributed through churches. Even though it was written primarily to the Roman church, there were copies, and they were distributed to churches. When someone says, yeah, well, the early church didn't have the scriptures, that's not true. Even the apostle Peter, in his writings, refers to the writings of Paul as scripture. They did have the same scriptures you and I had. They had the Old Testament. And as these letters were written, they were distributed, read, and the pastors read them to the people and taught and expounded from the scriptures. Paul wrote this letter on his third missionary journey. He had not really known the people of Rome that well, but he was writing to this early church. He was planning to visit them. He wrote the letter about A.D. 57, probably when he was in Corinth or Sincrea, which is a seaport city on Corinth, about six miles from the city. We know that from the people that he referenced later on in the letter. Romans deals with a couple of basic questions. One, how does a person become right with God? The word righteousness means right, in a right relationship with God, because sin puts us out of step with God. How does that happen in a person's life? Does it happen by obeying the law? Does it happen by keeping religious rituals? How does that happen? And the second question is, once a person is in a right relationship with God, how do they live their life in relationship to the Lord and in relationship to other people? So those are the two predominant questions that Romans addresses. How does a person become righteous? And how does a righteous person live? Now, there's some reasons that Paul wrote the letter, three primarily ones. He wanted to prepare them for his visit. He wanted to come and visit this church. He wanted to give a complete and thorough explanation of what the gospel or the good news of Jesus is. And he wanted to talk about the relationship of the Jews and the Gentiles, these Christians that came both from the nation of Israel, and Gentiles means nations and other nations, and how they were going to live together. And this is a common issue in some of these letters because they had cultural baggage that they both brought in regardless of where they grew up and what religious orientation they had. They often brought that into the churches, and they would try to make that a part of the normal Christian life. And a lot of these letters were saying, no, that might have been your tradition, or that might have been your culture, but now in Christ, we focus on the things that make us one, and we don't bring our personal views and personal traditions and add them to the teachings of Jesus. Now, the key passage of Romans that is the most important to understand is found in the first chapter, verse 16 and 17. When Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Now this next statement is equally important. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, which is by faith from first to last, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Let's say that. The righteous will live by faith. In the old English translations, it will say the just shall live by faith. That's because the word just or justified in the Greek language is the same word for righteousness. So to be justified means to be made righteous or declared righteous. To be righteous is to be justified. So those words are used interchangeably. Now, Paul says he's not ashamed of the gospel. It's good news. It's the power of God for the salvation for everyone. For the Jew first, because our Lord was Jewish. He came through the lineage of David. He was the Jewish Messiah. But not only the Jewish Messiah, he was the Messiah for the world. You remember the covenant that God gave Abraham in Genesis 12 and 3, that he would bless him, make him a great nation? What did he say? Through you, all nations will be blessed. Hear the phrase, all nations? So when you come to Isaiah, he says, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The last thing Jesus said was go into all the world and preach the gospel to all nations. So Jesus was not only the Messiah for the Jewish people. He was the Messiah, the Savior for everyone. Now what Paul says is the 
key truth to Romans and many of his letters. In the gospel, a righteousness from God, not a righteousness from man, not a righteousness that we create or generate. In the story of Jesus, there's a righteousness that's revealed. In other words, it's kind of hidden from us. We're not aware of it. We create religion to, to build our own righteousness. We write our own rules, and then we keep those rules, and we say, oh, I'm right with the rules. But righteousness can't come from us because we're sinful. There is in the gospel a righteousness from God. It is from faith from first to last. The just or the righteous will live by faith. In other words, the way that you receive that righteousness, it comes from God. You don't generate it. God gives it. And you receive it by what? By faith. From first to last, what does that mean? It means that you begin your life with Jesus as a Christian by faith. And you always live it by faith. You don't make the mistake of starting by faith and then living by works, which is what happens to a lot of people. They start by faith and they live by legalism. They start by faith, and they live by self-effort. They start by faith, and they live by ritualism. No, the righteousness comes from God. You're not generating it. It's a gift. And you receive it by faith from first to last. And he says this is nothing new. He quotes the Old Testament as it is written. In other words, this is found in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. This is what was taught in the Old Testament, that righteousness is from God. It was provided through Jesus. He quotes the Old Testament to build the case of what it really means to be a Christian. The righteous will live by faith. Well, he, throughout this letter, continues to amplify that theme. And you'll find that theme in many of his other letters, especially in the letter to the churches in Galatia, the letter of Galatians. The just, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, Romans, as you know, is quite a lengthy letter. And this is the most intense explanation of the gospel, the most thorough. It is the most weighty of all of Paul's letters. It's the most theologically rich of all the letters. There's a tremendous amount of information and revelation in the letter written, first of all, to the Christians in and around the city of Rome, but written to all of us. So let's look at the letter of Romans as four separate letters or this book we call it, let's look at his four small books. This is the best way to kind of stay with what the themes and the topics that he deals with. The first book is chapters 1 through 5. He deals there with the subject of salvation, the power of God under the salvation of everyone who believes. The second little book or section would be called separation. Well, how do we as God's people separate ourselves from this fallen world and live a holy, a different life. That's six through eight. The third little section is what we might call the sovereignty of God or the selection of God as he begins to deal with God's sovereign prerogative to select people, to select the nation of Israel, and even talks about selecting the Gentiles now who believe in Jesus to be a witness to the Jewish people. That God has the sovereign prerogative to select people for his purposes in the world. And that's where you would hear words like election, foreknowledge, God's right to choose who he wants for certain purposes. He deals primarily with Israel, Israel's rejection of the Messiah, God's love for his people. Paul talks about his intercession for Israel. And he talks about how all Israel will be saved, quoting the Old Testament prophets of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Zechariah, that all Israel will be saved. The final section, or the fourth section, is what we might call service. He talks about living our lives in service to God and others in ministry. So let's go through these four sections, these four smaller books and I would encourage you to read the letter like that. Just focus on the first five chapters and understand, well, this is the main theme. And watch how that theme continues to be developed. Now, let me, that's my favorite section of Romans, by the way, is the first five chapters. That section there on salvation or justification by faith. So the word justification means to be made what? 
righteous, and to be righteous is to be declared justified. He talks about, first of all, our need for God's salvation. If in the gospel, the message of Jesus and the work of Jesus on the cross and the resurrection is the power of God for salvation, the first question is, why do we need it? So it is as though Paul enters into a legal courtroom and he begins to build a legal case to prove us guilty. You know how a prosecutor presents a case to prove a person guilty? That's what he does in the first three chapters of Romans, and it gets very heavy. It doesn't take long to get under conviction, but that's the point. He wants us to realize the reality of sin. So he starts with verse 18, and he says, the wrath of God, and the wrath means the displeasure of God. It doesn't mean out of control rage, the displeasure of God. The wrath of God is being revealed against all the ungodliness of men who suppress the truth by their lies. He says they exchange the glory of God for images made to look like animals and birds and reptiles. Although they knew God, he says, they didn't think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. He says that God gave them over to a depraved mind to do things that ought not to be done. God gave them over to their shameful desires. So he begins to describe the commonality of humanity in sin. And he identifies a lot of sins. And he shows us that when we throw away the knowledge of God, he says, first of all, it's revealed in creation. Romans 1 and 20 is one of my favorite passages. When he says, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen so that men are without excuse. So he shows the whole world and he identifies our sins. And he shows how low we fall the further we get from the knowledge of God. As soon as we throw the knowledge of God out, our lives begin to be lived at a lower level. And you don't need me to build a case for that. You look at the culture today. Look at the music. Look at the arts. Look at what's going on in education. Look at the violence and the hatred. Look what's going on around the world. Look at the low level people live their lives. God is displeased with that. He sent a Savior to save us from that. But Paul wants to make sure that people realize they need salvation. So he has to build a case to convince people that sin is real. A case that we need made in our generation. We live in a culture that has thrown away the... We had it. We had it as a nation. We've thrown it away. And look at the lower standard of living that continues to happen in our culture. Well, then he begins to not only to deal with the nations, he then comes to his own people. Now, remember Paul was a Jewish rabbi, very distinguished, very knowledgeable man, a very legalistic man. That's what he called himself in Philippians 3 concerning their traditions, a legalistic Pharisee. But now that he met Jesus, he realized that he couldn't be righteous by keeping the law or sacrifices. He needed God's salvation in Jesus. And he knew that his own people, since they were the covenant of people of God, many of them probably didn't think, well, they needed Jesus for salvation because they were already in the covenant. So in the second chapter, verse 1 and following, he then turns to the Jewish people. And he begins to show them their sin, that even though they were children of Abraham, even though they were heirs of the covenant, that didn't make them right with God. Being right with God is not about what family you're born in or what nation you're raised in. It's about the condition of your heart before God. And that was the same challenge John the Baptist made to his people, remember? You don't say to yourselves, we're children of Abraham. Because God can raise up children of Abraham from these stones. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So John made the same case that the Jewish people of his day couldn't dismiss Jesus, the Lamb of God, because they were children of Abraham or because they had the law or the temple or the covenants. Those are wonderful blessings. But salvation is a matter of the heart, right? And that's in Judaism. The psalmist prayed, create within me, O God, a clean heart 
and renew a right spirit within me. So Paul then in the second chapter reveals that even the Jewish people need Jesus as their Savior. He says something very interesting, very controversial in chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. He says, a man or woman is not a Jew if they're only a Jew outwardly. For circumcision is not a matter of the flesh, but of the heart. He redefines Judaism as people who have their heart circumcised, which is not new. Moses used that phrase all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy, circumcise your hearts. That the circumcision of the flesh of the males of Israel was a sign of the covenant, an outward symbol. But it's not the covenant. The covenant is made between a man and God from his heart. So he builds all of this up, revealing sin, whether we had the law or didn't have the law. We had creation. That reveals sin. He finally comes to the climactic point of his presentation, and he says in Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everything you read from the beginning of the wrath of God from heaven is revealed. All of that is building up to that one statement. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But that's not the end of the sentence. And, this is verse 24, and all are justified freely by the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. All have sinned and all are justified or made righteous through the redemption. That's his death, burial, and resurrection on the cross that came by Christ Jesus. Well, can I be saved by keeping the law? Romans 3, verse 20. Clearly, no one will be declared righteous before God by keeping the law. Rather, by the law, we become conscious of sin. The law is God's standard. When we hear the law, we realize we don't measure up. It convicts us, reveals our sin, and awakens in us our need of salvation. Salvation then comes by faith in Jesus as the one who redeemed us from sin by his death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. Romans 3, verse 25 and following is one of the most rich passages you'll ever read about the mystery of the cross. He says that God presented Jesus as a propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation, you could translate it as an atoning sacrifice. The word of propitiation there in the Greek means to turn away God's wrath. So he said in Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is being revealed against all the ungodliness of wicked men. But when that cross was raised on Golgotha's brow, the wrath of God that was upon us turned away from us, came on Jesus. Jesus took our wrath, and because he took our penalty, God declared us justified and pardoned. That's why Jesus prayed from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When you ask God to forgive you, it's not something that God has to decide to do now. It's something God did 2,000 years ago on the cross. You just need to receive it. God presented Jesus. The great word presented means he put him on public display for the world and the powers of the heavens as a sacrifice of atonement, as a propitiation for our sins. And that's why eventually Paul builds up to that climax. See, once you accept Jesus, the wrath of God that's against your sin is turned away. It's no longer directed towards you. And he says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. No verdict of guilty. Why? Why can God declare me righteous? I'm not righteous. He can declare me righteous because Jesus took my wrath, took my judgment, paid my penalty, and gave me his righteousness as a gift. That's the good news of the gospel. And that's the righteousness that comes from God through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Righteousness, justification, is a legal term. It means to be declared righteous doesn't just mean to be made righteous. It has a legal meaning. It means to be declared righteous. So if you got a speeding ticket and went to the court and stood before the judge and paid your penalty, your fine, the judge would then declare you right with Georgia law. Correct? 
If you don't go and pay your penalty, they're going to put a court order out for you. And the next time they pull you over, that's going to come up on the police computer. Hey, you're still under the wrath of the first penalty, and they're going to haul you to jail. See, the reason you pay your penalty is to turn the wrath of the state of Georgia off your life. And the court can't declare you right with the state until you pay the penalty. But our penalty was sin, a debt we could not pay because we're sinful by nature. Jesus came, took our sin, took our debt, took our penalty, and that's the reason God can now declare us righteous. If you went to court with your speeding ticket and he said, well, pay it, and you said, well, I don't have any money, well, he's going to have to decide then what to do with you because you're not right with the court until you pay that penalty. But what if somebody in the court stood up and said, well, I've got a hundred bucks. I'll pay it for him. The judge would take their hundred dollars and declare you righteous. And that's what happened at Calvary. God took your sin. Buddha did not take your sin. He never talked about sin. Muhammad did not take your sin. He never talked about sin. Confucius didn't take your sin. He didn't talk about sin. Jesus took your sin, took your penalty, and God declared you righteous. Only in the gospel of Jesus will you find that truth presented. I've studied every religion the great religions of the world wrote a book on them this is the only religion you'll ever hear that truth taught that righteousness is a gift from God by faith religions will give you creeds and teachings and morality and holy days and offerings and caring for the poor but they won't give you salvation they won't present you with a free gift a righteousness that comes from God. The next time somebody says, there's no difference between the religions, you say, there's a big difference. There are many religions in the world, but there's only one Savior. Now, lest you think, well, that's true now that Jesus has come, but how did they get saved in the Old Testament? The same way. They were looking forward to the Messiah. So in chapter 4, he builds the case for the Jewish people to let them know this is no new truth. He goes all the way back to Abraham. Chapter 4 says, Abraham is our father. Verse 17, verse 12 through 17, we are to walk in the footsteps of the faith of Abraham our father. Abraham lived 2,000 years before Jesus, and how was he justified? Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So Paul quotes that, Romans chapter 4. Verse 2, he quotes Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, to say that people have always been saved by trusting God to do for them what they cannot do for themselves. And he presents the case. He said, if righteousness came by the law, or the promise God gave to Abraham came by the law, Abraham comes before the law. So the law of Moses wasn't given to save people. The law of Moses was given to give us a standard of how to live to make us conscious of sin so that we knew our need of God's grace. We've always been saved by grace through faith. In all of Paul's letters, when he teaches justification by faith, he'll tell the Old Testament story of Abraham. Think about the significance of that. This truth runs from Genesis to Revelation. Well, chapter 5, he goes into just the blessings of justification. When I got out of college, I, of course, I'd accept the call to preach. I couldn't get anybody to get me to preach, so I worked all kind of odd jobs. And I played at night in my brother's cover band, a couple of restaurants in downtown Atlanta, and worked during the day, construction jobs. And I got a job as a Kelly girl. That's on my resume. That's a temporary service. That's what they call it, the Kelly girls. So I went down and applied. I, I, got, a, you know, I got a few jobs. Uh, I, I remember working in a factory putting together metal shells in some factory near Six Flags. And I had a little green Gideon's Bible in my back pocket. I took, I memorized the fifth chapter of Romans during my break on that job. There is therefore now no condemnation, he says in chapter 8, verse 1. I love chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not only so, but we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Therefore, 
being justified by faith, we have peace with God. You want a relationship with God? You want to be at peace, not worried about your sin, your guilt? By faith in Jesus. Chapter 6 through 8 it deals with living a separated life from the world. Now that God has declared us righteous, we're born again, we have a new nature. We still have an old nature, right? And we feel that inner conflict. And so he, oh, chapter 6, he begins and says, shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? Some people were saying that, well, the more we sin, the more grace we'll get. And he said, that's absurd. Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. In other words, it doesn't have power over us anymore. He says in chapter 6, verse 4, that we were buried with him through baptism into his death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too may live a new life. Verse 11, he says, so consider yourselves to be dead to sin, unresponsive to it. Unresponsive to it, not controlled by it. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God through Jesus Christ. I love verse 14 when he talks about some practical application. He said, offer the members of your body to God as instruments of righteousness. He said, you know, when you lived in sin, you used to use the instruments of your body for things that were unrighteous. This was in one of my messages recently. Talked about how we could use our minds, our voice, our hands, our feet, our resources. Well, that's how we can live a holy life. Not by just trying to stay away from bad things, but by doing good things. Using your life, everything about your life, devoted to righteousness. Chapter 7 is a fascinating passage. Verse 14 and follow, he says, so that people don't misunderstand, he's not criticizing the law of God. The law of God is the Word of God. He says the law of God is righteous, holy, good. We're, the pr problem is not with the law. The problem is with us. We have a sinful nature. That's why we can't keep the law. And he writes one of the most open, honest passages. If you ever feel like a failure as a Christian, think, boy, I'm going through some struggles. I, I'm losing some battles. Read Romans 7, verse 15 and following. When he says, I find this law at work, this principle. In my mind, he says, I delight in the law of God, but I find another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin and death. The good I want to do, I don't do. The evil I hate, I keep on doing. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Well, Paul felt the same anguish we feel. When we want to do good in the sin nature, we lose the battle sometimes. We feel that. I like the fact that Paul was honest about that. And, and some real perfect scholars have come along and said, well, that had to be before he was saved. Because they don't want to be honest about their weaknesses. You know, you meet people like that, they pretend to be more than they are. They just can't stand it that he was gut-level honest. But he's not writing in the past tense. He's writing in the present tense. I know the difference between the past and the present. Anybody else? He said, I keep doing these things. Oh, wretched man that I am. Not oh, wretched man that I was. He felt that war. That's, that's what Christian growth is about. And when you fall like that, and I, have, I get emails from people, and I, I talk to men sometimes at the altar, Oh, I failed, and, they, and you, you, we hate ourselves for it. The worst thing you can do when you fail and you sin against the Lord is to stay there and start saying, I just can't live this. You know, God didn't want to hear me ask for forgiveness. That's the worst thing you can do. When you fall, get yourself up immediately. You say, Lord, I'm sorry I did that. That was a relapse. I'm not going to live like that. That's not who I am. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Get back up. If you stay at that point of failure, that's what you're going to become. You're going to keep convincing yourself, I can't live a holy life. Living a holy life is about winning battles, and those battles will never stop in your life. You're going to win them more and more, and you're going to get stronger. But you get up and keep going. Turn to somebody and say, get up and keep going. I don't have any problem with people that fail. I have a problem with people that don't get up. You've got grace. You've got mercy. Get up.
Well, he writes honestly about that. You know, it's interesting in Romans 7, he'll use the personal pronoun I about 20 times. Because that's what happens when you struggle. I'm this, I'm that, I'm not this. But it, and he says, who will deliver me from this? How am I going to ever win over some of these battles of the flesh? That's when Romans 8, he changes. He says, there's therefore now no condemnation. He, re he remembers something. There's no verdict of guilt is what condemnation means. To those that are in Christ, in a relationship with Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do and it was weak through the flesh. God had sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. As a sin offering condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Those who have their minds set on what the sinful nature desires have conflict, but those who have their minds controlled by the Spirit have life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It is not subject to the law of God. What a magnificent passage Romans 8 is. Verse 12, we are debtors not to the sinful nature to obey it, but debtors to the Spirit. Verse 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. For God has not given us a spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. The next time you fall, you remember that. The Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you're the child of God. Quit telling yourself you're not a Christian just because you fall. There's a difference between being a Christian and being, a, being perfect. You can be a Christian. You can't ever be perfect. Let the Holy Spirit bear witness with your spirit. You're the children of God. If we're children, then we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. Verse 18, I, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth being compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Verse 26 and 27, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit intercedes with us with groans that cannot be uttered and expressed verse 28 in all things god works for the good of those who love him to those who are the called according to his purpose for those he foreknew he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers moreover those he predestined he also called those he called he also justified and those he justified he also glorified what shall we say then in response to these things if god before us who can be against us he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, yea, rather risen again, and is seated at the right hand of God, who ever lives to make intercession for us. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or nakedness, or famine, or peril, or sword? No in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us you remember this the next time you fail for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels or principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other thing in all of creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord praise the Lord so that's all I have time for is half of Romans so you're going to study the next little book on Israel, election, and you're going to read about Jacob, have I loved, Esau, have I hated. You're going to say, how can God say that? That's not about salvation. That's not about heaven or hell. All it means is I chose Jacob and his lineage for my purpose and not Esau. God loved Esau. God blessed Esau. But God had the sovereign prerogative to choose Jacob for what he wanted him to do. So when you read about election, you, for some of you, are from, if you grew up like I did in Presbyterian, you're used to words like election, predestination, foreknowledge. People say, well, God has predestined some people for heaven and hell. No, he hasn't. And when you read that passage, you won't hear one reference to heaven or hell. You won't read one reference to eternal salvation. It's not about election for salvation. It's about God's sovereign prerogative to elect people. To do, and he elected Israel as a witness to the nations. He's elected the Gentiles now as a witness back to Israel. It's about his sovereign prerogative to elect or select people for ministry. For his calling and his purposes. Not their eternal destiny. And the last part is just incredible. The last book on our service. 
I'll just, quote, I'll just close with a few personal highlights. It's magnificent the way that that begins in chapter 12. He begins to tell us how we ought to live in service in the church and then in the world. Chapter 12, verse 1 is, is magnificent. I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercies, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. In verse 3, he says, No one should think more highly of himself than he ought, but think of himself soberly in accordance with the measure of faith God has given him. And then he tells us that God has given spiritual gifts to every man, every member of the church. If it's prophesying, let us do it in proportion to our faith. If it's teaching, if it's encouraging, if it's giving, he talks about using our gifts in the church. And as your pastor, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking your gift, whatever it is, and serving in the church. This church will only be as strong as your giving. It won't be as strong as your receiving, and receiving is important for all of us. But the strength of the church rests on your service and my service in the church and to God's people. And he writes about that importance of serving. He talks about how we should live together. Verse 9 is very interesting. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Love must be sincere. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. He says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. That end of Romans 12 is magnificent. The last verse is so good. I wish our politics, I thought about this verse when I listened to something on politics yesterday. When he says, don't be overcome with evil, overcome evil with good. When somebody attacks us, we don't have to attack them back. Overcome evil with good. That's how we live. Chapter 13 is interesting. They lived under the control of the Roman government. But he told them to be subjected to the authorities of the government. To give honor, to pay taxes. The only time we should not be respectful and obedient to government is when the government tells us to do something that violates our faith. Then we have to appeal to a higher loyalty, and that is to King Jesus. Like the early church, they were submissive until the government told them to stop preaching. They said, you've gone too far. You can't command us to do something that Jesus commanded us to do. He told us to preach to all nations. You're in submission to him, so we'll disobey that. Acts 5, 39 we must obey God rather than man. So there is a time for civil disobedience with Christians. Only when the government persecutes our faith and tells us we can't practice our faith or preach the gospel, then we have to appeal to a much higher loyalty that we have. The day is almost over. The night is here, he says in Romans 13. Let us put on the armor of light. Our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Let us clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus and don't think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. That's how chapter 13 ends. There's an interesting statement, and if you've ever taken a, a financial course, you might have heard this. I just want to make one quick comment on it. Hebrews 13, verse 8, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves has fulfilled the law. He who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. People say, well, you shouldn't have any debt. That doesn't, they didn't say that. They didn't say not to have debt. You read about debt all through the Bible. There's nothing wrong with having debt. It says, pay, pay your debts. Let no debt remain outstanding. See the difference? There's no problem having a debt. It's part of economy. Borrow money, lending money. The key is don't take advantage of people. The Bible never, never has anything negative to say about debt except charging people excessive interest. They call that usury. Or not paying your debts. That would be stealing. Unless we couldn't pay it, and then we have laws for that, like bankruptcy. That's to help people in dire situations. So it doesn't say not to have debt. It says, let no debt remain outstanding. But one debt we never pay off, and that's to love one another. We're always indebted to each other, to love no matter what anybody does to us. We owe them a payment of love. Let's all make our payments to our wife, to our children, to our friends, even to our enemies. We owe everybody love. Chapter 14 is one of my favorites. It's very important for Christians to read this. Christians came from different cultures like we do. They had different opinions about things. What kind of foods to eat, what to drink. People still have those issues, right? They have different opinions about things that aren't clearly stated in Scripture. He builds the case 
He, he asked us in chapter 10, who are you to judge your brother? You and I should never judge another Christian for something they allow in their lives that's not clearly forbidden in Scripture. That's their personal conviction. In fact, he says that we should not even pass judgment on disputable matters. If something's not clearly stated in Scripture, we shouldn't have an opinion on it. We don't have to make a ruling on it. It says not to pass judgment or a ruling on disputable matters. Who are you to judge your brother? Each of us must give an account of himself to God, he says in verse 12. Verse 17, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking because back then they had kosher foods, non-kosher foods, and people were saying, well, you can't eat that. That's not, that's not spiritual. Paul says the kingdom of God is not a matter of diet and what you drink. Being a Christian is not about petty things, but it's about bigger things, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Verse 19 and 20 is so important. Every Christian needs to know this and live it. Let us make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food or arguing about which foods people can eat. Now take the word food out, put a blank there. Don't destroy the work of God over politics. Don't destroy the work of God over your personal view about something. Don't destroy the work of God over your preference. Don't destroy the... When people are legalistic and petty, they are destroying the work of God in the church. Keep your life focused on righteousness, peace, and joy. Do everything that leads to peace. If you ever do anything that disrupts the peace of the church... You're out of the will of God. If, we, if I ever do anything that disrupts the peace of the church by preaching politics or my personal, I'm destroying what God is building. And these Christians that argue and fight and contend and argue about the rapture and argue about whether or not they can have a glass of wine or not, and on and on they argue about little petty things are destroying the work of God. We are commanded to do at least a peace. If it's not making things more peaceful, we're doing the wrong thing and saying the wrong thing. If we're saying the right thing and doing the right thing, it's going to lead to peace. And mutually, everybody's going to be built up. People aren't going to be knocked down or condemned or destroyed. I love that passage, and I think it's so important. And I can speak straight to 40 because you're men. I can, I can talk straight here because it's a men's group. Let's do at least a peace. And the mutual edifice, if we have personal convictions, that's great. But Paul says, whatever you believe about these things, read it for yourself. It's in chapter 14. Whatever you believe about these things, keep it between yourself and God. Don't tell it. Nobody wants to hear it. Right? Read it for yourself. I'm quoting. Keep it between yourself and God. Chapter 15 has got a couple of my favorite highlights. Chapter 15, verse 1. The strong ought to bear the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. If you're married, you know, sometimes in your marriage, you're going to be stronger than your wife. And sometimes your wife is going to be stronger than you. I mean, people don't want to give up on their marriage because their mate is weaker, spiritually. The stronger one ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Because there's going to come a day when all of us are weak we need somebody who's stronger to help us, not condemn us. In verse 7, accept one another then, just as God has accepted you in Christ. What a spirit of acceptance. Well, it ends with a benediction. I just want us to read it together out loud. A fantastic benediction. A closing. And there, there are many of these in scriptures. These, a, word, a benediction means a word of blessing. I love that whole chapter. So it's, in, it's the very end of the letter, chapter 16, verse 25 through 27. Let's read this. Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, hidden for ages long past, but now revealed and made known through the prophet, prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him, to the only wise God, be glory forever through Jesus Christ. 
Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word. We receive it gladly tonight and pray that we will grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In your holy name we pray. And everyone said amen.